Hello there and welcome back. And having just looked it up, I can confirm to you that sometimes the Feronians are called the Horseshoe Worms. So just FYI, that's their common name. Cool, huh? They're kind of cool, slightly weird creatures. You may want to have a quick read about them. They're, they're pretty neat. We certainly won't be covering them in this series of lectures because they don't have much of a fossil record. Sorry about that. So in this particular video, we're still talking about brachiopods and now we are going to be looking at their morphology. So we're going to learn um, some things about the morphology of the um, brachiopods. As ever, I've put some uh, words just above this video, which are the ones that I think are quite important and you may want to learn. As ever, I will repeat my apology um, that paleontology is full of long words and blame the Victorian uh, and 19th century scientists for it, those guys. And I will plough onwards. So you may remember that um, the brachiopods are basically defined by having this ciliated feeding organ. Ciliated means kind of like hairy, got a load of um, things called cilia um, attached to it, um, called a lophophore. And that's compared, that's contained, sorry, within a pair of shells that are otherwise known as the valves. This image here shows what I think of as a fairly typical brachiopod, right? Um, the uh, larger of the two valves, which is most clearly um, visible in this image here, is generally the ventral, or otherwise known as the pedicle valve, because that's where the pedicle sticks out of, as I'll get into a, uh, into, into a, a second. Um, so in this image here, right, we're looking at a dorsal view. We're looking from above the animal onto its back surface, and you can see the, the ventral valve sticking out the bottom here. Often in the group, the pedicle, this is a fleshy stalk, exits an opening at the apex of the ventral valve to attach the animal to the substrate. You can see that here in this image and here in this image. The pedicle itself can be anything from a thick fleshy stalk to delicate thread-like strands anchoring a brachiopod in fine mud. So that's, that's kind of like two end members of this range of different forms of pedicles. And indeed, I should highlight at this point that some fossil brachiopods lost pedicles entirely. So some of them instead just lay recumbent on the, um, the, uh, the sea floor. I'm doing that. So they would just lie down like this, sitting in the sediment. All partially within sea floor sediments, or they would cement themselves to surfaces. So above, or at least in this orientation, the um, ventral valve, we've got the dorsal or the brachial valve. And this houses that extendable lophophore, which is used for feeding. Bear in mind that brachiopods can be very variable in shape, even within a species, right? For example, a single species can have outlines of their shell that look like a range of different orders of brachiopod. This is quite problematic. What do you think? This may mean for our ability to identify species of brachiopods in the fossil record. You may want to have a think about that and ask questions about it in the Zoom session if you're interested in wondering what the impact of this may be. But I wanted to, to uh, talk about the morphology of these animals today, so I'm going to move past that question about species and get into a bit of the nitty gritty of what makes a brachiopod. So brachiopod soft parts, as I've already mentioned, are enclosed by those two morphologically very different valves or shells. The lophophore, which we found find on the dorsal valve, is integral to all essential biological functions within brachiopods. It um, looks after respiration, so breathing, excretion, so getting rid of waste products, food gathering, and even reproduction. Shells are generally opened and closed during, for example, feeding cycles by a variety of muscles. You may want to compare that to um, bivalves. If you recall with bivalves, they have um, muscles that pull them together and then a ligament that pushes them apart. Not in the brachiopods. In the brachiopods, we've got two sets of muscles um, within a typical brachiopod. And this is again, um, this actually only applies to one group as we'll learn in a minute, but two sets of muscles, uh, one of which is actually um, there to open the valves and the other one is there to close it. 
So the exact arrangement of those muscles is modified across the three subphyla that make up the uh, brachiopods. And those muscles leave masks. As such, the internal shell structures include various muscles, um, muscle scars, sorry, I should say, and platforms, as well as teeth and sockets, uh, thing, and things called cardinal processes. These are projections onto which muscles attach that open or um, that tend to open the shell on the dorsal surface. So you can see a typical um, dorsal view of another kind of brachiopod here. So some of these have ribs on their surface and they will often have growth lines. And you can see a cheeky cross section through a, um, through a brachiopod showing you a bit what they look like um, on the right hand side here. And I guess the things that I really want you to note at this stage are this pedicle opening through the uh, ventral valve, the dorsal and the ventral. And also I suppose that this is actually the posterior of the animal, it's, it's back, um, uh, so it's back side, I should say, I suppose. And the uh, front of the animal is, is where they open. Right, so there, it's quite different to the other um, bivalves that we've seen, and we'll get onto that in just a little bit. Now, I want to spend the um, rest of this video just digging down a little bit into the different groups of bivalves. I don't necessarily expect you to remember all of these details, but some of the uh, names for the different bits are really quite important. And I think within the, for this group, it's probably best for you to look at the list I put above the video and label your diagram um, based on the 3D models I've put below the video using some of the knowledge that you've picked up while watching this. I'm going to start by looking at the Rhynchonelliformians. So this is kind of actually, this is kind of the, um, these are the articulated brachiopods. These are the ones that um, certainly I have seen most commonly in the field. Um, these have a pair of calcitic valves, so their, their valves are made of calcite, but they also have a fibrous secondary layer. Uh, I'll be showing you what that means and what that looks like in the next video. They are hinged posteriorly, so at the back of the animal, and they open anteriorly along the commissure. So I mentioned that in the last video. The commissure is just the line along which they, they open. Articulation within these animals is achieved through um, some teeth on the ventral valve, the bigger one, uh, and some sockets on the dorsal valve, the smaller one. The valves were opened and closed using muscles called the diductor and the adductor, and those oppose each other and leave scars in the shell. As you can see here, you have adductor muscle scars and diductor muscle scars. Most, but not all, members of this group attach to the substrate using their pedicle that emerged through a hole in the ventral valve, and that hole is called for a foramen. Foramen is actually just is used in quite a lot of different groups. It's just a, a, a kind of a, a word for an, an opening or a hole. The images on the right show a couple of um, typ typical or important forms. The ones with the white background here are spiriferids. These are quite easy to recognize because they've got this long hinge line um, and they're common in later Paleozoic rocks. And the right are orthids, which are a very common group in the lower Paleozoic, particularly in the Ordovician. So this is what you tend to see when you're doing field work in different parts of the Paleozoic. And certainly these are the ones I feel most comfortable and familiar with. The other things, uh, labels you may want to pay attention to on this um, diagram, uh, some of these are obvious, are things like rib for one of the ribs on the shell and a growth line for one of the growth lines on the shell. Um, the umbo, so much like in bivalves, the kind of the, the, the youngest, the kind of bit that represents the juvenile bit of the shell is called the umbo. And you may want to have a quick look at the, uh, the teeth and the sockets here. But I think the re remainder of these labels are not really important to, um, to, to be anything other than conversant with. You don't need to learn them or anything like that. So that was the Rhynchonelliformia. Now we're looking at the Linguliformians. So these are things that actually look like um, a, uh, a well, the kind of uh, the, the most iconic species member of this group is the, the I shouldn't say species, not species, but is the, the Lingulids. And these are those um, 
bivalves that make their shells out of organophosphatic materials. So this is calcium phosphate mixed with proteins and a structure called chitin, that kind of hard structure that arthropods used that we mentioned in lecture one. Typically within these groups, and unlike the last ones that we saw, the valves are pretty much symmetrical. So um, in the last group, uh, sometimes you would have uh, far bigger uh, ventral valves and dorsal valves, not so much the case within this grouping. And they open, these valves open and close um, using a complex system of muscles. There is no real hinge mechanism. The pedicle either emerges between both valves or through a, a foramen, depending on where you are within this group. And they develop from a plankton feeding larval stage within this group. They're characterized by a U-shaped alimentary tract, so that's the kind of their mouth to gut tract, that ends in an anterior anus. So that's an interesting thing about their biology, essentially. And you can see that on this diagram here, labeling the different bits. And I think what's most interesting about these is that they open their shell through the withdrawal of the soft parts uh, posteriorly, forcing the valves apart. So rather than having this nice hinge mechanism to open with muscles closing, um, these things actually squish their body around to try and force the valves apart or pull them back together, which is kind of um, interesting. You can see that some members of this group, especially the living uh, members, which are quite iconic, have this really long pedicle. And rather than attaching to, um, to really hard substrates, they will sometimes attach to kind of looser sediment. The bits that you need to remember in terms of the um, labels on here are pretty much just the pedicle, I think. This just gives you a, an idea of their um, internal anatomy there. So that's the second group. And I wanted to finish by um, highlighting um, the third group, that's the craniformians. These are diverse and they're probably a mon monophyletic group, but they actually, uh, members of this group look quite different from each other. Unlike the, um, the last group that we saw, their shells are based on calcium carbonate and they are also inarticulate. So they don't have a well-developed hinge. They opened and closed their shells during uh, using hydraulic mechanisms rather than muscles and generally had a mode of life where they attached to a hard object with all or part of the ventral valve. They've got no pedicle at all as a result. Um, you can see some uh, a typical interior to one of these here with a number of different muscle scars labeled on there. So again, you've got um, a ductor uh, muscle scars, uh, you've got some medium muscle scars and lateral muscle scars within this group. So I wanted to note for you on the right that this creature here, this big one, is an Ordovician articulated brachiopod. It's actually a thing called the, uh, from a group called the Strophomenids. Um, and this is not a member of the, uh, the group that we're talking about, the Cran Craniaformians. Actually, the, it's these smaller things that are encrusted on it that are a member of this group. And here's a close up of one of these to show what they actually look like. So this is typical of this slightly weird group of brachiopods. So that's the three major groupings of the brachiopods and that's brachiopod morphology as a whole. The key question I think you may face as um, working geologists is how do you tell brachiopods apart from bivalves? And that is a, uh, a question that you really shouldn't be getting wrong, I, don't th I, I think, um, at any point in your career stage. So bivalves shown on the left here are fundamentally different to brachiopods, right? If we look at the commissure of bivalves, um, many of them are symmetrical around the commissure, this opening. That is not true of many brachiopods, which is quite uh, indicative. So you can see an example here where the commissure goes down there. These two sides are not mirror images of each other. So essentially what I'm saying is that bivalves in, in most, well not all cases, have two identical valves, and that is not true of the majority, they're not all brachiopods. Okay, so that's one way you can tell them apart. Bear in mind that this underlies a really fundamental difference in their biology. In bivalves, um, you have the right and the left valves, um, whereas in the brachiopods, you have dorsal and ventral valves. The actual um, directions the animals are facing in is quite different. <clears throat> 
So the other way that I find really useful um, to tell these apart is that in brachiopods, the plane of symmetry bisects both valves perpendicular to the plane along which they open. So if you get one of the, um, uh, you know, what, either the dorsal or the ventral valve and you look down on the uh, creature, it's symmetrical left to right when you're looking down that way, right? That's not the case in the bivalves. In the bivalves, if you turn them sideways and look at the split between them, they'll be symmetrical across that. Okay, so that's the fundamental difference between bivalves and brachiopods. And I'm going to put some uh, models just below this video to help you really nail that difference because you need to be able to tell the difference between the two groups. Okay, so that's a really important thing to remember. So please do have a look at those models and make sure you can get your head around how those two kinds of shells differ because it's really, really um, good to be able to tell them apart. And with that, I'll be coming back in the third video to highlight what brachiopods look like when you find them in a rock or a thin section and then highlight why they're useful to us as geologists. So I'll see you soon.